Now, I want to talk very briefly about this word fellowship. <coughs> because I was saying to a sister this morning, sometimes the word fellowship is used very, very lightly. And we do not always necessarily understand what we mean by fellowship. And that's applied to myself as well. Yes, it is a word which is banded about, particularly amongst Christadelphian people. Uh, yes, we have fellowship one with another, but what does that mean? <coughs> well, I resorted to a dictionary <coughs> to find out what the dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary definition of fellowship really is. And this is what I discovered. Fellowship is a group of people meeting to pursue a shared interest or aim. Quite simple, quite straightforward, and unequivocal. So, well, where does that put us then? Well, our interest, and this is what we want to share with you, our interest is in the Bible. It's not the only interest we have, but it is the most important interest that we have. This comes above everything else, or should come above everything else uh, that we are interested in. Or, or that we want to share with one another or with people outside. We don't even want to share this or have this fellowship with our own people, can I put only in inverted commas, not meaning to be swell-headed about it, but we want to have fellowship or understanding or helpfulness with other people, not only about religious matters, but about all kinds of things that are important in life. So as we say, our interest then is in the Bible. This is just one of the many aims that we have, interests and aims, and we'll come on to the aims in a moment. But why are we so set on following the principles which are illustrated for us or written down for us in the Bible? Well, there are two, uh, two uh, quotations which we all know that are in this room this afternoon, I think, uh, which help us in this respect. The first is to be found in 2, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Because people will say to us sometimes, yes, but the Bible is dusty, musty and old-fashioned. It's written in Old English, and we find it difficult to understand. But you know, we have discovered over the years that with carefulness and careful searching, it doesn't matter that it is written in Old English. We have here the sure word of God. There's no two ways about that. The Bible tells us so. And this is the first of the two quotations that we're going to offer you to show why we can be so dogmatic that <coughs> we're saying that the Bible is the word of God. So let us then turn to the second epistle of Peter, chapter 1. And here we've got some very straightforward words. We're going to read from verse 16 to possibly the end of the chapter. And this is what uh, Peter wrote, or God caused Peter to write by inspiration. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made un known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we shall come back to that phrase later. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light of shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day start arising in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So there we are, we've got it. Prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God. And they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of God. So we have to be careful, you see. We make sure that we are aware that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, over lunchtime, some of us have been talking about this question of the different um, accounts of the Bible that are now available to us. 
And sometimes we feel that man has put his own interpretation on these things. And only by going back, even though it is archaic, even by going back to the AV, we find the real and truthful answers to the many questions that Christians seek. And not all of them, of course, are as fastidious or as careful in their reading of the scriptures. In fact, many, many, many of them do not read the scriptures at all. So that's the first point. The second one is to be found in uh, a letter which has been sent to um, uh, Timothy by the Apostle Paul. And we're going to go in there into 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to take verses 16 and 17. And here we read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Notice there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which links up with this thought uh, in, uh, in Peter. We go back to verse 15, which we haven't read, and there's a warning here, which I think is apposite. We take 14 for connection, but continue thou, says Paul to Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Continue thou in the things thou hast learned. But it also adds, you've got to be careful whom you learn these things from. You've got to be discerning as to what things you take as being truthful, what things are scriptural rather than what might be the opinions of a man or a woman come to that. Remembering that the Bible has been inspired totally by our almighty God. So this is why we are so, um, I was going to say fiercely uh, defensive, that's perhaps not quite the right phrase, but we are defensive of people who would try and deviate from the message which God has sent in his own way, through his own people. And we can look back on their lives in the Gospels and beyond and see what kind of people they were. So please take that as being a substantial uh, tenet for us to build on this afternoon. Now, we come back to this question of fellowship, and we say that there are several aims here which we have, which we share in common. Well, these are far too many to deal with in uh, 20, 25, 30 minutes. But one of the things that we seek to do together, and we've done that this morning, we've done it this afternoon, and no doubt people will be doing it in their homes later on today and throughout the coming week and so on. So the first of these is to read and understand the Word of God. It's no good just reading it. If you don't understand it, go back over it and over it. Think back to school days when we were told to read, m learn, mark and inwardly digest the things that we were being taught. And if you don't understand it, you'll go back over it and over it and over it again. And if necessary, seek help from somebody who you think might be able to help. Someone might be able to help you, but also you might be able to help someone else in their understanding too. So we want to understand the Word of God. The second aim that I've written down here is to learn all about God and his purpose with the earth and with mankind. Now that, of course, is a tremendous challenge, isn't it? We can't possibly know all there is to know about God and his purpose, but we've got a very good idea what God wants of us, what God wants of all of us, not just a few, but all men and women no matter what nation, creed, or nationality they might be. All of them are important to God. Again, as we quoted this morning, uh, John 3, 16, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have uh, the opportunity of life everlasting in his kingdom. So that's quite important. 
So it isn't just a select few people who've been chosen to receive the word. God sent the word for everyone to digest. And it's up to each and every one of us to pass on the knowledge that we've managed to glean from the scriptures in the hope that they too, the listeners, they too might be able to understand and might have the interest to dig in more deeply into the word of God. And the second, well, I've just really mentioned it, the third aim is to pass on to other people what we have learned over the years. Now, we haven't time to turn up such a lot of quotations, but if you go to the end of the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus gave the injunction to his disciples, which in turn was passed on to us, go ye out into all the world and teach those things which I have commanded you. It wasn't just for those ten people that were left behind. It's for them and, if you can imagine just a little tiny taproot going down into the soil, eventually that root spreads and spreads and spreads. And by now that root must be absolutely ginormous. And it's been, it is, it has been, it is, and it will be up to the generations that come to pass on this message, which is of vital importance to everyone. And the fourth aim, which is a little more personal perhaps. The fourth aim is to be like God's Son, Jesus Christ. And you can almost hear when you're talking to people who have not, no real knowledge of the Bible, well, Jesus Christ, yes, we've heard all about Jesus Christ. We've just been thinking about Jesus Christ's birth, we've been thinking shortly about his death and resurrection. But do they really think at, at Christmas time well, it's an atheist thing, isn't it? Well, yes, it was in part, but it doesn't alter the fact, doesn't alter the fact that it's celebrated at Christmas, the birth of Jesus, <coughs> when in fact the birth of Jesus may not have occurred then, it may have occurred in September, if you look more carefully at the details given in Scripture. The question of lambing and lambing time certainly wouldn't have occurred in December. And it's a shame that the Christian faith and all these other pagan religions became moulded together and it was convenient for the church to accept Christmas as being the time when Jesus was born. Similarly come Easter, the most interesting thing to the children will be Easter eggs and sweets and all this kind of thing. The adults may just briefly ponder on what it's all about. But we as Christadelphians don't just ponder at Easter. We think about the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice which he made and his command to break bread and drink wine in, mem in memory of the sacrifice that he made. And we do this every Sunday, as long as we are able. And sometimes people will break bread in the week in their own homes, remembering again the sacrifice that was made for us. And we'll be coming back to that a little later. Now, why have I got so rather heated about this sort of thing? Well... I'm a little hesitant how to put it, but I have got a very good friend, not of Christadelphian faith, whose age is round about 56, 57, and he's always been very keen on uh, pop star music and so on. I enjoy it to a certain degree. People like Tina Turner, Elton John, and in Paul's case, David Bowie. And he shattered me on one occasion by saying, David Bowie is my God. I said, I'm not quite sure what I'm hearing. And if you go up into his attic, I haven't been up there, I can only tell you what he's told me. He's got just about every disc and album that this particular man has made. And every time anything appears in the paper, he takes out the cuttings and stores them as though they're pieces of gold. Right or wrong? As far as we're concerned, wrong. As far as we're concerned, we avidly read everything in the scriptures and treat it every page as if it were a bar of gold. And this is the aim that we have in life, to follow Jesus and to be like him. So why have we chosen to uh, call our talk this afternoon the world's greatest role model? 
Well, if you think back over the last couple of years, we've been bombarded by a lot of sporting events. And sometimes when the athletes or uh, the footballers or the tennis players or whatever, the swimmers, whatever they might be, they're interviewed. And you often hear them say, <coughs> well, yes, but David Wilkie is my role model. I'd like to be like David Wilkie, one of the great swimmers. Or I'd like to be like Usain Bolt, a tremendous runner. And you've heard this time after time after time. It's not only just with sport though, as we just suggested, it's in other fields of activity as well, where people are seen to be doing well and being at the top of their flight. Yes, we want to be like them. Well, we suggest to you, in all faith and in all human kindness, that the best role model is the Lord Jesus Christ. And why do we say that? Because we are told in Scripture that uh, Jesus was perfect. That's quite, <coughs> quite a thing, isn't it? Perhaps we'll come back to that in a little, not a little while. So, well, who is Jesus Christ? Many people are very vague if you ask that question. And we have to look into Scripture for an answer. Well, if we go, we're already in Matthew's Gospel through the readings that our brother had, uh, did for us. If we go to the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, the very first chapter and the very first verse really does set uh, the seal on what we're trying to get across this afternoon. <clears throat> so Matthew is saying, and remember this is under divine inspiration, so this is God speaking through Matthew so that we might have a true understanding. Chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, there's a mouthful, isn't it? The son of David. Well, if you go and talk to some of the older Jews, I'm not sure about the younger ones because I'm not sure whether their faith is still as strong as it was, but you talk to the older Jews and they say, you say, well, who's David? And they'll tell you that David was the greatest king that ever lived as far as the Jewish nation is concerned. They refer to David as David the great king. And so here we are told through inspiration that Jesus Christ was the son of David. Well, not literally the son of David. But his ancestry can be traced right back to David himself. And that's quite an important thing for us to understand. So he was of the line or the ancestry of David. Now if we go further down the chapter, we find in verse 18 that the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When? As his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, again, we reiterate, is the power of God. And that, for many, is a stumbling block. It is a stumbling block. You can't get their heads around it. But you have to have faith. We're told in Romans that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we need to have faith. That's what God has said occurred, and that is what did occur. Verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, we're not going to go any further back, but we can, as you, if you read, you will realise that some of this is foretold, as it says here, in the Old Testament readings. But we, we mustn't get uh, bogged down by that this afternoon. I don't mean that irreverently, but we, we've got enough to do to look forward rather than look back. So two things here. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, by the power of God. So Joseph was not his natural father, but Mary was his natural mother. So here, this young fellow had, I suppose in a way, dual nationality, if you want to be flippant and put it that way. He was the son of a man or woman or human being, but he was also the son of God 
which made him extra special. And because he was the son of God, he was empowered with all kinds of uh, talents which we don't have. But that doesn't mean to say that because we haven't got them, certainly there are not many of them that Jesus, or not, sorry, there are many of them that Jesus had that we can have, but there are a few of them which were given to him and to him alone. And we have to leave those on one side. So we have this then, this wonderful chap now entering into the world and we are saying to you that he was son of man and son of God. Son of man perhaps you can accept, but what about this question of son of God? Well, come further into Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we go into Matthew uh, chapter 13, I think is the one we want, uh, and we'll have a look at what it says there as far as scripture is concerned. Quite a long chapter, we want the 55th verse. Matthew 13, verse 55. First of all, we need to stress his humanity, his human nature. Verse 53 of Matthew 13. And it came to pass that when Jesus finished these parables, he departed thence. When he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue in so much that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man these, this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? So yes, he created quite a stir. But there we have it quite categorically that Jesus was something special. He was the son of a carpenter. We know that Joseph, from what scripture tells us, Joseph was a carpenter. But he also had great learning. And this, of course, was given to him by God. So we would learn then that definitely he was the son of Mary and the son of God. And this is how Jesus is referred to throughout Scripture. Well, it's so difficult, isn't it, uh, to sort of convince people of, of these sort of things. Um, I've got down here Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. Let's just have a look and see what we've got there. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. This will help us to... Um, understand more clearly that he was the Son of God. Okay then, so Matthew 17, uh, we'll take verse 3, I think, for connection. connection. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, very often in religious circles, you will find that they will uh, quote that first sentence. And those last three words are muffled or neglected altogether. Hear ye him. And this is what we're saying to you this afternoon. This is a Son of God. Ye hear ye him. Come back a little bit into uh, Matthew chapter 3. And there's another quotation there which will also uh, substantiate what we're trying to show you this afternoon. So we go into Matthew chapter 3 and we are treated to the account of Jesus being baptised. Verse 13 of chapter 3. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptised of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptised of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptised, went up straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So there we are. God is, that's twice we've had a look in Matthew's Gospel, and it can be found in the other Gospels as well. 
This is God saying, yes, this is my lad. I'm satisfied with the way things are going. In fact, I'm very pleased with the way things are going. Why don't you listen to him? Why don't you model your lives on his life? And then you will be pleasing to me. It's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge to us. <laughs> and of course, you see, we have, we'll come back perhaps to this point in a minute. I would like us to go now to the reading that we have together because we're talking about challenges. And here in Matthew 5, the first 12 verses, we've got a list of challenges here. Notice that there are multitudes involved this time. Now, I think I'm right in saying that most of us accept that these, or the parable, the Sermon on the Mount, was intended primarily for the disciples of Jesus. But you see, from verse 1 of Matthew 5, Jesus saw the multitudes. Oh, they got used to seeing this man going around and listening to him, talking about all sorts of wonderful things, things which they'd never dreamed of. Perhaps there'd been a lot of oppression in their lives, and they realised that this man was talking about freedom. And so wherever he went, he was very, very rarely alone. Very rarely. If it wasn't his disciples that were with him, it was the disciples and the common people. Because scripture tells us, in one instance, that the common people heard him gladly. They took the news from him as though it was the latest thing off the press. And here was something new that nobody else had talked about. So come back then to Matthew 5, 1. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we go right the way down uh, these 12 chapters. Verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Well, that would ring the bell. Because these people had their own version of it as it was of the Old Testament, the Torah. Yes, they were able to understand what Jesus was saying. And they would know from their history that the prophets were all persecuted in one way or another. But despite that, they maintained their stance and their belief and their trust in God. And so it was that Jesus did come into the world and ushered in a new era of things. And this is why the people were so excited as to what he had about what he had to say. So there is a challenge. There are lots of things in there, and you can look at this at your leisure. How many of those things can you say you can see in your life? If not, why not? And I'm asking myself that as well. It's not just me asking you. Because what I've heard I'm saying this afternoon applies to me just as well as to anybody else. Because we're not, all of us in this room uh, are professing to be Christians, and so we are. But we are not perfect. We make errors and mistakes. We always have done. We always will do. So what was different about Jesus then? Well, I said to you earlier on, he was perfect. And, well, how can we prove that? I'd like us to go back uh, and also go, go forward into the New Testament and have a look in the epistle which Paul wrote to the Hebrews. And we go in there at chapter 4. And we go down part way, down through the, well, it's almost towards the end of the chapter. Yes, there we are. So Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eye of him with whom we have to do. So whatever we do, we can't hide, we can't run away, 
we can't do a Jonah on it and jump into the sea or take a boat and go somewhere else. Even then, God was with Jonah and God knew what he wanted Jonah to do and Jonah did it in the end, despite himself. Then verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, speaking of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hold on to what we got, for we have not, for have we not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points of tempted like we, as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was an ordinary man, man of the woman, son of God, but he was subject to all the passions and so on of life, the same as you and the same as me. The difference being, he was not tempted. He didn't sin. He was perfect. So now let's think again about those two quotations. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Well, of course, that perhaps puts a new complexion on the whole thing, doesn't it? That is why we suggest that Jesus is the greatest role model in the world. Now we've already <coughs> had a look at some of the aspects that Jesus had in his own life by looking at Matthew chapter 5. These were, uh, or these verses, give us an idea of what kind of outlook Jesus had on life generally. Uh, we just want to pick up, again, we're going to go back to Matthew 5, I've deliberately left this bit to this point. It's not that we've lost our, out uh, any of the quotations, but we needed to put in that little bit of chat before we came back to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we look uh, again at Matthew uh, 5, 38. Now that's the verse I've got down here. And this shows the outlook that Jesus had on his life. Remember what we've read in the first part of Matthew 5, Verses 1 to 12. Verse 38 says, and this is Jesus speaking, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Where do we fit into all that? Can we put our hands on heart and say, well, yes, we follow that implicitly? I think not. I certainly can't. But this was the outlook that Jesus had on life. There is the tremendous challenge. So again, this is why we suggest to you that this is the greatest role model. Obviously, a role model that never makes any mistakes is certainly one to follow. Do remember then that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was perfect and that God was well pleased with him and God says to us through the pages of Scripture, hear ye him. Is there a greater role model anywhere else? I think not.